Shivaji Maharaj. And Shivaji Maharaj also is a great guy, you know, he's a fantastic hero. And Indians don't understand the value of, the, of this man. In France, we have Napoleon, and Napoleon is like, you know, for us, France, it's, it's still a hero, you know. We have a. Sure. I was born near Les Invalides, you know, it's that museum, huge museum, and every year there are books and films about his life, his mistresses, his laws. He's made so many laws which are still today in use in France. Shivaji Maharaj was in power with Napoleon. He was even more spiritual. Sri said he was a vibhuti. He was someone sent to defend India against foreigners. And the foreigners were Aurangzeb at that time. And with a few hundred men, you know, and his wits and his courage and his heart, you know, he stood against the most powerful army in the world. And Aurangzeb, as you know, who wrote his own will, said, you know, my biggest blunder in life was to have let Shivaji Maharaj escape from Agra. <laughs> right. In his will, by his yeah. own hand. You know? yeah. So, again, Aurangzeb is so important in Indian history because he has such a high place in Indian history books, even written by Indians. And because of Kashmir, because Kashmir is the shadow of Aurangzeb, you know, the Kashmir used to be a Sufi place and now it's totally overtaken by the shadow of Aurangzeb and the hard Sunni, Wahhabite, you know, <coughs> spirit of Aurangzeb. And because of Shivaji Maharaj, I thought, but this man is not a hero, he was a monster actually. Because he raised, you know, all the temples of Hindus, you know, he killed them, converted them, imposed the Jidata. There was a French doctor in the court of Aurangzeb called Dr. Francois Bernier, and he wrote a book when he came back to France. And in that book, he describes a scene where Aurangzeb himself, with his elephants, tramples upon in Delhi on Hindus protesting the Jiji attacks. So, we built an exhibition on Aurangzeb according to his own record, because Aurangzeb was a very meticulous emperor, and you know, he lived till 80, which is very old for that time. And he was so proud of what he was doing. He was very proud, you know, so whatever he did, you know, he put it on record and signed it, and these records are kept in India. Some are in the Bikaner archive, and I got my professor access them, and some are in Hyderabad, and we're in the process of getting all of them from Hyderabad. And every deed of Aurangzeb is recorded and signed by him. So we got hold of them, we got a team of painters, and we painted scenes which describe Aurangzeb in his own words. And you have his writings and the translation. Right, right. So when he orders the to destroy a temple, there is his order, which we have, and we did a scene painting destruction of the temple. So that also was opened in Delhi by Sri Sri and uh, Mr. Advani. And that exhibition is a difficult exhibition because you were talking about difficulties. So, so there I, I encountered difficulty. In Delhi, you know, people disagreed and they wrote it or they came to me and said, why do you do that? Why do you want to wreck the past? You know, this is communal disharmony. That was it. But when I brought it in Chennai, and it was exhibited in a very prestigious place in Chennai, the, there is a guy in Chennai whose ancestor was named by Aurangzeb. He's called the Nawab of Arkot. I don't know if you heard about him. Yes. He had a palace in Chennai. And he came to see that exhibition. And he happened to be friends with the son of Mr. Karunadidi, who then was in power. Mm. His name is Stalin. Mm. Yes, what a name, what a name, what a yes, name, yes. Mr. Stalin. <laughs> so Mr. Stalin sent one of his highest officers to close down the mm. exhibition. I yes. was in Delhi. And the, the, the police came, there were two old ladies who kept keeping the exhibition, they took them to jail and they threw some of the paintings on the ground. There's a painting describing the destruction of the Somnath Temple, which was destroyed, destroyed seven times, as you know, once by Aurangzeb. They threw it on the ground, you know, that time my paintings were framed in glass, so it was, it damaged some of the paintings. And I flew from Delhi, you know, got the ladies released, but it took me six months to get back the exhibition. I brought it to Pondicherry, repaired it, then sent it to Pune. And when the museum opened uh, in 2012, it, it is now exhibited there permanently. But it's still an exhibition that, though it is historically impeccable, that, you know, triggers controversy. Yeah. And you know, there's recently a, a book by uh, one of the persons I'm criticizing now is uh, Sheldon Pollock. He's got a whole school of Indology, which is very biased, Hindu-phobic and all. And one of his students, who is now a professor at uh, 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 Rutgers University, she has written a book on Aurangzeb. 
praising him and he's this great guy and all of us and people like you I guess she doesn't name though are all these chauvinists and saffron and nationalists and all these bad guys but Aurangzeb is a hero. So I think this this business about uh, bringing the truth about Aurangzeb is going to go on for a while because there's going to be people on the other side who think he's actually a hero. Yes, many people still, I mean there are many people who still worship Aurangzeb in India and abroad but uh, you know there's, a, there's a one of our paintings Aurangzeb is supposed to be a patron of arts, but actually the musicians of his court, because he banned music, it's contrary to Islam, right. he banned music. So there is a scene which is historical. The musicians were Muslims, so Hindus were converted to Islam to be able to play music. They buried yeah. their instruments in a mock burial, and we painted that scene. You know, and this is very symbolic of what Aurangzeb was, and he was a monster. Burying the arts. Burning the arts, you know, and I mean, he killed his, he poisoned his father, you know, he beheaded his brother, his brother Darashuko was actually the eldest son and the preferred. He was supposed to take the throne. He was supposed to take the throne, Shah Jahan liked him and he wanted to take the throne, yes. so uh, Aurangzeb had him beheaded and he imprisoned his son and his will, in his will again he said, never trust your sons, you know, what a, what a man, you know, who <laughs> says, never trust your son. Yeah. So why do you think uh, uh, Indians love the oppressor. It's very strange. Some kind of Stockholm Syndrome. See, um, you, um, you know, you look at the Chinese, they were never colonized, except, you know, very short period. Uh, uh, so they are proud. I mean, they're proud to the extreme. Uh, they, but Indians, I think, were colonized. Too long. Too it's long. not just British, it's also Islamic colonization. Yes. And that's another thing, we do not refer to the Islamic period as colonization as though they were one of us, although they were foreigners who came and they colonized us. We only talk about the European colonization. Yes. And so right. there's, there's some denial of the Islamic colonization. We've sort of domesticated Islam and feel that now it is just one of us, not realizing it's thousands of miles to the, in another continent and it arrived here violently. Very violently. I think the trauma of the Muslim invasions, there is some professor who calculated that a hundred million Hindus died from the time of the Hindu Kush till Mumbai, you know, 2011. That, that trauma, I think, is still alive in the unconscious, you know, collective of the Hindus, you know, and, and it triggers panic and fear and the, the spirit of Kshatriya is lost in India. And that... Ab Pura Hindus